Hare Aung Namaha. Unless they're too painful, everyone remembers crossroads moments in their lives. These were the times of decisions of impact, ones which locked in the course of the future in some very specific way, in some very big way. To be a crossroads moment, it had to be comprehensive and major in consequence. We may regret one or more of them, and conversely, we may thank our lucky stars, there is truth in that asterism, by the way, that we made the crucial decision we did at that momentous time. In no small part, we have had or still have powerful intellectual and emotional responses to these moments on the basis of how things played out after that decision. The Sanskrit for this principle is known as palena parachiyate, judged by the results. In relation to any specific crossroads moment, if we analyze our decision in relation to it in an unbiased way, in the vast majority of cases, we shall come to this conclusion. The more that critical thinking was integral to our decision during that moment in our lives, the better the decision was. In other words, with but few exceptions, we did not just luck into a good or a bad result at a crossroads moment. Applying critical thinking, which actually means intelligence, to a crossroads situation could only have helped. The more the better. As such, there are three factors here to consider. The crossroads moment, our intelligence in relation to it, and the mind's decision after undergoing the stages of thinking, feeling, and willing in relation to the crossroads moment. The willing being the decision. Critical thinking from the Vedic perspective, which is all we're interested in here, that term critical thinking is a kind of misnomer. It is not the intelligence which thinks, it's the mind which thinks. Superior to the mind is the intelligence which discriminates and deliberates. According to the teachings of His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, intelligence is defined as fine discrimination in activity with good memory. Thinking is from a different, lower level of the mental quantum. However, we shall continue to use the terminology of critical thinking in this presentation, although you should be aware of its context. In other words, what we're referring to is actually intelligence. It is not the thinking facet of the astral body, the mind. When intelligence is engaged in trying to serve Krishna consciousness, that is called Bhuti Yoga. It begins with the working principles of Bhuti Yoga and it advances from there. As just mentioned, from the Vedic perspective, intelligence is not merely rumination. On the contrary, it is fine discrimination in separate word activity. Deliberation in Krishna consciousness is integral to Seva Yoga, and a synonym of Seva Yoga is known as Buddha Yoga. Let us again consider and return to those crossroads moments. They are most important to us, granted, but these are not at all limited to human beings. There are crossroads moments for communities, 
There are crossroads moments for corporations. There are crossroads moments for nation states. There are crossroads moments for organized religions. We could easily fill a multi-part series discussing all of this in the contexts of these categories, along with human crossroads moments. But if we did that, it would be both diversionary and tangential. Instead, in this month's presentation, we're going to consider but one crossroads moment. As you could only expect, it was in Prabhupada's branch of the Hare Krishna movement of Krishna consciousness. It was ultra momentous. It remains controversial, although it should not be so. Its purport and import is so great that it would not be wrong to consider it as merely very important that it's on a scale all of its own. You may say that these judgments are nothing more than your host speaker's opinion or his prejudice, but that would be wrong on your part. These judgments about it are not subjective, they are objective. Since the spring of 1978, all hell has broken loose in what only superficially appears to be Prabhupada's Bhakti Yoga cult, known by its acronym of ISKCON. Now, that hell breaking loose is a very long story in and of itself. Integral to it, however, is an event which took place in late May of 1977, a little less than one year earlier. The issue here is measured in scale in terms of importance. A bit of clarification is herein best inserted. Prabhupada dictated to his leading secretaries, who then transcribed them onto written pages via a typewriter, over 6,300 letters. He personally signed all of them. These letters were to his disciples, his well-wishers, interested people, corporate entities, so on and so forth. There was a gradation of importance to them. In other words, although opinion, to some extent, could differ amongst his disciples, you could categorize in terms of importance and revelation the top ten letters he ever signed and sent out. For example... While visiting Tirupati, India in late 1974, Prabhupada dictated a letter. The date was April 28th of that year, so it actually wasn't late 1974, it was early 1974, and that letter was to Rupa Anuga, one of his leading secretaries and prominent governing body commissioners. Except for the Neomut faction, Virtually every Prabhupada disciple, initiated or otherwise, would agree that this important and historically detailed letter would qualify for the top ten amongst all of those thousands sent out by snail mail. Similarly, there would be the top ten Prabhupada initiation ceremonies where he either directly conducted it or was present for it from his Vyasasan, this would be measured mostly in terms of how prominent it was, how many of his devotees attended it, how many of them were initiated at that time, and whether or not something new was revealed by him during it. The first initiation in the summer of 1966 would certainly qualify for the top 10. The mass initiation ceremony at Moundsville compound in the late summer of 1972 would also probably make the list. Then there would be temple dedications, which Prabhupada attended. This would include laying the cornerstone, as well as inaugurating the opening. There would be a list of the top ten governmental officers that visited Prabhupada and had room conversations with him. 
There would be the top religious or cult leaders who Prabhupada met with and confronted, as he always confronted all of them. The meeting with Yogi Bhajan in the Honolulu Center on Kohela Way in the first week of June 1975 would certainly qualify in the top 10. Next, we come to the category of room conversations with his initiated disciples or with his disciples and dedicated followers. They entirely took place in one of his rooms at one of his centers and must be considered the most important of all room conversations. Except for the Neomut faction, what we will find and acknowledge when it comes to grading the importance of these is one room conversation in particular. Indeed, it stands alone, far above all of the rest. Even throw in all the room conversations with anyone and everyone, it still stands alone and higher. It is completely on a separate scale all by itself. Sure, it was momentous, but it was much more than that. It was integral to what was supposed to transpire in his movement compared to what actually went down. The tape recording of it, however, was secreted away for years until the summer of 1980. Remember, it took place in May of 77. Although all governing body commissioner, commissioners attended that room conversation, and, or they were all ordered to do so, by the way, only six of them were actually privy to the essential part of it, and that essential part is all we're going to deal with here today. Only that essence is the part that will be analyzed. It became known in devotee scuttlebutt as the appointment tape, a consequential misnomer created with an intentional design to mislead. As just mentioned, in the long run, only a very small portion of it was actually all that important to the Hare Krishna movement. That small part of this particular room conversation, not much more than a minute in duration, if that, is today still considered controversial. However, if you want to transcend the so-called controversy surrounding it, you are herein given the opportunity to do so. It can be understood, and it must be understood. If you are sincere and serious in spiritual life, and if you identify with Prabhupada's branch of Lord Chaitanya's Hare Krishna movement, after hearing and or reading this presentation, you will understand this discussion accurately, and in some detail be assured. As many of you know, this multi-part series reviews the second literary work of Henry Doktorsky. As an established author who knows well how to order chapters in his literary publications, to his great credit, he quickly proceeds to the controversy surrounding the so-called quote-unquote appointment tape recorded in the late spring of 1977. This decision is astute on his part. The first chapter of 11 Naked Emperors, henceforth to be referred to by its acronym ENE, -E, Doktorsky presents a synopsis of the history of Gaudiya Vaishnavism and the place of Prabhupada's branch in it. He also presents some essential biographical notes mostly connected to Prabhupada's beginning his movement in the United States of America. In the second chapter, focusing upon the early days of the movement, the very early days, he points out how Prabhupada's leading men came from entirely malecha and degraded stock, and thus not much could be expected of them. Indeed, that degradation is exactly how the saga played out after Prabhupada left physical manifestation in late 1977. 
It was brilliant of the author. After those first chapters, focused mostly upon the 60s, actually, to skip far ahead to that important meeting a decade later. e e thus avoids much clutter of the intervening years, because getting into all of that, what to speak of detailing all of that, the vast majority of it went down within the time stamp of the 70s, and all of that would really be unnecessary to detail. As aforementioned, the so-called appointment tape was recorded on May 28, 1977 in Raman Reti, a district near the Yamuna River within the famous devotional village of Vrindavan, India. It was recorded in Prabhupada's quarters within the Krishna Bolaram temple complex. It was apparently attended by all of the governing body commissioners of ISKCON, at least all of them had been summoned to attend it. However, the essential part of this conversation between the great spiritual master and his incompetent leading secretaries was directly witnessed by only six commissioners. That event took place in an adjunct room connected to the main area of his personal quarters, which were extensive. Two of those commissioners asked questions and made comments, with some of those comments being inane. The other four remained silent, which remains most disappointing. This brief interlude of the essential part of the overall meeting is what this month's presentation, as well as Chapter 3 of ENE, centers upon. In other words, although some other topics and business issues were discussed amongst the whole GBC assembly, many were of what could be considered spur-of-the-moment transitory importance. One of them related in a rather obtuse way to this essential part of the conversation, but the rest of them did not. We shall not devote time or font space into any of that, obviously, although ENN mentions quite a bit of it. So we're going to skip all that from Chapter 3. Satsarup Goswami was selected, how he was so selected is not clear, to ask two questions of Prabhupada and seek clarification if need be, and let me tell you, was clarification ever needed? One of those questions, obviously, was of maximum raw nerve variety. It was a bad play by the GBC to pick saintly sets for this assignment. The embodiment of humble pie, he was also too laid back to be the lead questioner. Almost any other long-serving commissioner would have done a better job than Sutz Roop, who could be, and most importantly was, easily overridden by any leading secretary more powerful. Indeed, that's exactly what went down. In other words, he was interfered with and overridden, older, overridden by the powerful Nyasi TKG, who was the personal secretary of Prabhupada at the time. You will easily confirm this for yourself as this analyst proceeds, analysis proceeds. Early in Chapter 3, E.N.E. points out how Satsvarup was a bad pick to conduct the interview. Quote, Later he, referring to Satsvarup, confessed that he felt, quote-unquote, shy and uneasy and, quote-unquote, foolish and awkward during this important conversation with his spiritual master. Consequently, Satsvarup's questions were difficult to understand. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada's answers, therefore, were also not easy to understand, and since then, scholars and pundits have espoused very different and diametrically opposed interpretations to this important conversation. Very accurate overview by him here. But it should not be misinterpreted to mean that all of those interpretations are accurate. <laughs> Definitely not. Most of them are not accurate and are way off. 
if they are all opposed in some way to one another, which is the case, then either none of them is accurate or at most only one of them could actually be called accurate. As such, do not fall victim to the sentimental psychic syrup of giving them all equal credence. Although the key exchanges between Satsvarup, TKG, and Prabhupada will be presented in chronological order, we're not going to continuously post that conversation in an unbroken form or in one fell swoop. Instead, your host speaker is going to break it up into sections in accordance with how e and &E divided it in the same way in Chapter 3. Accordingly, there will be accurate analysis after each section, so let us proceed from the beginning. Satsvarup, our next question concerns initiations in the future, particularly at that time when you are no longer with us. We want to know how first and second initiation would be conducted. Prabhupada, yes. I shall recommend some of you. After this is settled up, I shall recommend some of you to act as officiating acharyas. TKG, is that called Ritvik Acharya? Prabhupada, Ritvik, yes. So this, don't be bamboozled by this after this is settled up. They're talking about something else previous that was pending. No big deal. So E.N.E. comments on this opening section as follows. Quote, Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada's immediate answer is simple and straightforward. He would recommend some of his disciples to act as Ritvik Acharyas. None of the GBC members at the meeting could imagine that their spiritual master intended, after his passing, that the disciplic succession would be continued by Ritvik representation. An order to continue the Parampara by Ritvik representation would have been unprecedented in the history of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. Unquote. Uh, this is spot on commentary. It is rather self evident, but nevertheless recognized as such by ENE. Its author mentions that no one in the room, those six men, could possibly have fathomed that this answer given by Prabhupada, I shall appoint Ritviks, had anything to do with how the movement would be carried on after he passed from physical manifestation, and that's very correct. This fact was buttressed by Doktorsky a bit later in the chapter as follows, quote, The devotees assumed that Prabhupada's answer regarding Ritvik Acharyas referred only to the first question, how will initiations be conducted during his presence? Unquote. Correct again. Heavy Maya then enters the conversation, and it's introduced by Satsarup when he mixes apples and oranges as follows. Satsarup, then what is the relationship of that person who gives the initiation and the Prabhupada? He's guru, he's guru. Satsarup, but he does it on your behalf. Prabhupada, yes, that's a formality because in my presence what should not become guru, so on my behalf, on my order, Amara Gyaya Guru Hana, be actually guru, but by my order. Iani -E, e -E picks up on this Maya to some extent, but far from fully. Quote, Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada explained that a disciple who was sufficiently advanced to become a bona fide Diksha guru would not initiate his own disciples until after Prabhupada had passed away. Quote, that is a formality, unquote. The disciple would be Diksha Guru after the departure of the Acharya, but not without first receiving a direct order from the spiritual master, quote, be actually Guru but by my order, unquote, unquote. This last excerpt from Prabhupada and the concept underlying it was integral to the conversation, granted. However, it would be particularly reinforced near the end of this slice of conversation. 
Doktorsky introduces it here while commenting on Satsuru mixing up the guru who gives the initiation, and that guru can only be Prabhupada. By initiating, uh, by introducing it early, it acts kind of like a hanging participle. However, this is of minor consequence. The main point is that Satsrup is careless with his terminology and Prabhupada decides not to clarify his mistake of combining the guru who gives the initiation, which always means the Diksha guru, and the Ritvik who merely conducts the ceremony. The actual fact is that Prabhupada, covertly but effectively, dealt with both Satsarup and TKG tersely in this conversation, and both of those men thoroughly deserve that treatment. Tatvamasi. Again, there were four other sannyasis present there in the room, Rupa, Anuga, Kirtan, Ananda, Bhagavan, and Jagadish, but not one of them spoke up. Of course, we all know now, the mega-egotistical TKG interjected at this point and made his presence known in, more, in order to muddy the waters even further. Satsvarup, so they may also be considered your disciples? Prabhupada, yes, their disciples. Why consider? Who? TKJ, no. He's asking that these Ritvik Acharyas, they're officiating, giving Diksha, the people who they give Diksha to, whose disciple are they? Prabhupada, they're his disciple. TKG, they're his disciple. Prabhupada, who is initiating? He is grand disciple. Satsvarup, yes. TKG, that's clear. As clear as mud. This is the middle of the conversation. TKG sees that the Ritvik has now allegedly been empowered to also be the Diksha Guru. He sees that in the wrong way, but it fits well into his desired paradigm. It's a misconception on his part, but he could easily parlay this misconception into the Ritviks transmogrifying into initiation, initiating spiritual masters after Prabhupada, quote unquote, was no longer with us. That is what he and the others did. TKG does not seek necessary clarification because he likes what he's hearing. He can use it. And let me tell you, he did use it. From this middle part, for all practical purposes, we get nothing. It's a jumble of nonsense, particularly made so by TKG. It is loaded with Maya, and Prabhupada could not have been expected to have picked through and corrected all that, and he didn't. The Maya, however, could have even dug deeper. Those six men in the room could have concluded that the Ritvik Acharyas of the coming present time, eleven of them would be named soon after, would also be making their own disciples, even while Prabhupada was physically present, as absurd as that sounds on the face of it. In other words, a loose interpretation could have been made that the Ritviks, while they were performing the ceremony on his behalf, were also and simultaneously Diksha Gurus of these new disciples. In 2006, this is more or less what was proposed by a then new offshoot faction of the Ritvik heresy known as Prominent Link. Prabhupada could have cleared all of this up, but he chose not to do so. I personally glorify him for making that decision. E&E does not get heavy into the potential contradictory juxtaposition 
although it does recognize it as muddy in the waters with this entry, quote, although TKG says that's clear, he was certainly incorrect in that conclusion, as the whole flow of these questions, interruptions, and interjected opinions by the two sannyasis made the whole thing very unclear, unquote. Thus far as we make our way through chapter 3, ENE is accurate and helpful. In one sentence here, excellently, excellently constructed, its author has summarized an important conclusion. The two men selected to get their questions answered muddied the waters, particularly TKG, with absurd questions, interruptions, comments, and presumptions. Actually, E&E treats them with kid gloves in this by calling TKG's quick summary, that's clear, as merely incorrect. It was far worse than that, as it laid the groundwork for future false presuppositions. Doktorsky continues just a bit later with the following overview, quote, Any disciple must first become spiritually advanced and then, just as importantly, receive the personal order from his spiritual master to become a Diksha Guru. If he does not receive the personal order, he cannot initiate anyone into the devotional line because he is not an initiating spiritual master, unquote. To a degree, once again, he's getting a little bit ahead of himself in this comment, but that can be readily overlooked. In the Vaishnav branch, established by his divine grace, Srila Prabhupada, in order to be Diksha Guru, the initiated disciple, meaning properly initiated disciple, must be following a guru who is a very perfect man. E&E touches upon this truth here and does state that the Diksha Guru must, must be spiritually advanced, but really the Guru must be a very perfect man. E&E also states that the Guru must receive the order to be an initiating Guru directly from his Guru. In this case, that would only be Prabhupada because this conversation was taking place while he was still physically manifest. We then reach the conclusion of this brief and enigmatic section of the all-important room conversation of May 28, 1977. Satsrup, then we have a question concerning Prabhupada. When I order you become guru, he becomes regular guru, that's all. He becomes disciple of my disciple, that's it. We are obliged to spend a good deal of time and font space on this conclusion because there is so much spiritual substance to it. First of all, it completely obliterates any legitimacy to the illusion that this exchange between Satsarup, TKG, and Prabhupada, which we've just presented, was all and only about the Ritvik in absentia concoction. Most definitely, that Maya is smashed here by the statement, quote, unquote, disciple of my disciple. And as we know, the term regular guru is introduced. Some consider it to be unclear and a bit enigmatic, but it really is not. Quote, the statements of Thakur Bhaktivinoda are as good as scriptures because he is a liberated person. Generally, the spiritual master comes from the group of such eternal associates of the Lord. But anyone who follows the principles of such ever-liberated persons is as good as one in the above-mentioned group. The guru's from nature's study are accepted as such on the principle that an elevated person in Krishna consciousness does not accept anyone as disciple, but he accepts everyone as expansion of his guru. A person who is liberated acharya and guru cannot commit any mistake, but there are persons who are less qualified and not liberated 
but still can act as guru and acharya by strictly following the disciplic succession, unquote. 13. From Easy Journey to Other Planets. He must not take on unlimited disciples. This means that a candidate who has successfully followed the first 12 items can also become a spiritual master himself just as a student becomes a monitor in class with a limited number of disciples, unquote. Then from the Bhagavatam. The second class devotees are therefore meant for preaching work. And as referred to in the above verse, they must loudly preach the glories of the Lord. The second class devotee accepts disciples from the section of third class devotees or from the section of non devotees. Unquote. Your host speaker could certainly provide even more conclusive evidence than these three quotes. But these alone should suffice. Notice the following terms and descriptions follows the principles as good as a liberated Acharya. Guru from nature study, which means still connected to material nature. Less qualified and not liberated. Still can act as guru. Strictly following. Remember that statement by Prabhupada in, at Bombay on April 22nd, the same year, 77? Little things strictly following can also become a spiritual master. A monitor must take only a limited number of disciples. Consider those terms and descriptions. Regular means under regulation. Vidhi sadhana bhakti means under regulation. Such devotees, when advanced, which they aren't when they're neophytes, still must be strict followers of the rules and regulations. Where's the difficulty? This devotee is obviously the regular guru, spoken of by Prabhupada in the Q&A of May 1977. The monitor guru accepts a limited number of disciples. He is not fully liberated he is a guru under nature study. Maya is still studying him and has not yet fully released him. But let me tell you, the Bhava Bhakta, the Mahabharat, he's fully released from Maya. But still, the monitor guru, the regular guru, is an advanced devotee. He's spiritually advanced. Prabhupada summed up the whole issue concisely and clearly in the last part of it. He also demolished what would turn out to be the Ritvik heresy about a dozen years later. Did he foresee it? Sure he did. As such, he crushed it in advance. Quote, when I order, unquote, is self-evident. And he never officially ordered any of his disciples to be initiating spiritual masters. There's no official record anywhere. And that would be required, which means he only appointed Ritviks. As such, Prabhupada answered both questions, and they were mutually exclusive. He appointed Ritviks in the second week of July of 1977, so initiations in that present time would be reinstituted. And although he never officially recognized or appointed any initiating spiritual masters, he spoke on the principle. And Ritvik got crushed in advance. A tremendous and concise summary by the greatest spiritual master. And it was done in the presence of six dull secretaries who only at most or at best muddied the waters with their inane presumptions and interruptions. 
Ian E. then follows all this up with some more commentary, and most unfortunately, Maya enters into it. Quote, In this passage, Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada explains, he, my disciple, becomes regular guru, that's all. But what exactly is a regular guru? In the, in the entire Bhaktivedanta Veda base, this is the only time he mentions regular guru. And here's the Maya. Some of Prabhupada's disciples interpret regular gurus who simply mean shiksha guru. Horse crap. And others interpret it to mean amatyam adhikari diksha guru who has not yet achieved perfection in the uttama adhikari stage and therefore must follow the regulations. The word regular appears to refer to regulation of vaiti satna bhakti, devotional service according to scriptural rules and regulations, unquote. Why mention the nonsense opinion that the regular guru allegedly refers to Shiksha guru? It's an absurdity. The whole discussion with Prabhupada centered around initiation. Note that Shiksha guru was never mentioned in it. And then all of a sudden, Prabhupada would arbitrarily switch to the topic of Shiksha guru, although none of the previous questions and answers had anything to do with either Vartman Pradarshaka or Shiksha Guru? Nonsense. Now, there's some other comments in Chapter 3 by Doktorsky that do not produce clarity in his chapter, but I'm not going to list all of those. This one that I'm listing lends credence to an idea, and it's a very bad idea, which Ritviks can manipulate into evidence that the whole discussion was about Ritvik because he was referring to Shiksha Guru. No. Only the beginning was about Ritvik Acharyas, and that's self-evident. The other Mayaka comments in Chapter 3 are all minor and of no real consequence, and they really don't produce any damage. Quote from e, &E. The important portion of the May 28, 1977 conversation with Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, which concerned initiations at present and after Prabhupada's departure in the future, was more or less botched by the two sannyasis who asked the questions. Although it is very muddled by Satsvarup and Tamal Krishna, some claim it still can be conceptually understood." Unquote. Guess who does this? That's right. Your host speaker is one of those who claim that it can be conceptually understood. And I do understand it. And now with this presentation, you're also invited to understand it in the same way, which means in the right way. In other words, to employ an analogy, there is heavy fog surrounding and encompassing all the various interpretations of this May 28th discussion about initiations in the present, which meant 1977, and then initiations after Prabhupada would be no longer physically manifest. We require complete clarity. That can only be produced by the right interpretation. And those that differ from the right interpretation are known as misinterpretations. And that means that they're biased and meant to mislead, at least subconsciously. E and E removes heavy fog, and it removes lighter fog also. It leaves a mist, however. As such, Chapter 3 cannot be classified as completely valid by any measure in relation to its interpretation. Nevertheless, it's helpful. We require to interpret and realize this crossroads moment, event, in the Hare Krishna movement in the right way. We require to see it and interpret it clearly. We cannot settle for mist. We require to see it just as you see the reflection of the sun on a placid pond at noon on a cloudless day. And that is what you are provided here. We do not want any maya allowed 
in relation to the accurate interpretation of this essential discussion of guru, initiation, and initiated disciples. Although chapter 3 does conjure up some of that maya, and was it done in the name of being fair and balanced? I have intentionally chosen to only give one example of one such instance. This detailed chapter of 11 Naked Emperors provides too much transcendental good in order to give it merely an average grade. It is certainly in the category of an above average effort and as aforementioned, its placement at the beginning of the book as the third chapter is an example of higher intelligence. It merits a straight B grade, and that is the grade I thus give it. In summary, here's what you should glean from the correct, unbiased, and accurate analysis of this essential room conversation on May 28, 1977. Point one, Prabhupada was asked two questions, not just one question, two questions. Although Satsarup foolishly joined these two separate questions with the conjunction and, Prabhupada was not at all obliged to correct that fault and he did not. Point two, Prabhupada was asked how initiations were to be conducted at the present time, meaning as it turned out more or less the rest of 1977, and how they were to be conducted after he was, quote-unquote, no longer with us. He answered both questions separately in ingenious and concise ways. Point three. When Satsrup conjoined Ritvik with Diksha Guru, Maya entered in a big way. The interview from that point on was botched, although Prabhupada did his best to give us spiritual substance despite that. Point four. All of TKG's interruptions and false clarifications were on the basis of conjoining Ritvik with Diksha. As such, they were all Mahamaya. They did not produce any clarity whatsoever. On the contrary, they produced heavy fog. When TKG said, quote-unquote, that's clear, it was nothing more than subconsciously mocking his own self and his fellow sannyasi. It was not merely a Freudian slip, because he was able to get what he wanted from Prabhupada, and having done so, he unsuccessfully attempted to immediately terminate the discussion at that very point. Point five. Prabhupada knew TKG's actual motive the whole time, and as such, he made no deliberate and intentional effort to expose it. Instead, he gave all six of those men enough rope by which they could hang themselves, which is exactly what they did when they converted, which, with the much-needed help of Swami B.R. Sridhar, their appointments as Ritviks into appointments as Diksha Gurus, although Prabhupada never authorized any such transitive arrangement. Point six. His divine grace crushed Ritvik in advance of its event horizon in late 1988-1989, which is Tri Kalagya, Prabhupada being Tri Kalagya, he knew that it would manifest, and he crushed it via the terminology Disciple of my disciple. Point seven. In principle, Prabhupada only authorized regular gurus. That means he only authorized Madhyam Udhikaris. He never officially appointed, recognized, or named any regular gurus what to speak of a successor. Point eight. He made it crystal clear that just such a regular guru could only be authorized to initiate new disciples on his order. In other words, they could not become genuine gurus, diksha gurus, on their own authorization, or, more importantly, on the authorization of the governing body. Final point nine. 
that the tape recording of this essential room conversation was called, quote-unquote, the appointment tape, was the misnomer of the 20th century. That almost no one even knew that this went down in the spring of 1977 is a travesty. The tape, what to speak of its accurate transcript, was squirreled away in a vault at Los Angeles and hidden from the devotees at large, the real workers, for over three years. This tells you all you need to know about the pathological and deceptive statuses of the quote-unquote, air quotes, ISKCON misleaders. The colossal hoax, known as the fabricated so-called ISKCON confederation, is a pseudo-spiritual scam. The Hare Krishna movement was converted into its doppelganger in the spring of 1978 when 11 ultra-ambitious sociopaths became fully absorbed in self-apotheosis and took over both the governing body and its movement at large. They did so via bogus authorizations. One such quote-unquote, authorization, was the phantom of an appointment tape recorded in early 1977, until three years later, virtually all devotees in the movement did not come to realize that this appointment was, in, actually, in actuality, an appointment that never was. It was a crossroads moment when it went down, and the leaders of the movement failed all of us by taking the wrong path at the crossroads. In the purport to Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, Chapter 9, Text 43, Prabhupada specifically states the Vedic truth, quote, One who is now the disciple is the next spiritual master, unquote. If you have not analyzed this room conversation until now, then you are also at this moment at a crossroads moment. Make the right choice and take the fork in the road on the path that leads to light. Such a step certainly entails a rejection of so-called ISKCON and a, reject a rejection of Ritvik, which both misuse the so-called appointment tape but in vastly different ways. Sadeva Samya.